Well, hello everybody. Today's lecture is going to be about civil litigation. This is part one of a part two uh, slideshow series. And in this particular uh, slideshow, we're going to talk about jurisdiction, parties, pleading, discovery, and termination without trial. This is all the things leading up to um, the actual trial itself. All right, so let's talk about jurisdiction. But before I even get to jurisdiction, I want to talk about where do lawsuits come from? It's when people get angry at each other. People cannot get along. Something happened. So the example that I'm going to use is that I ran over grandma. I ran over grandma. I backed over her. I didn't see her. That is where it all started. Now the question is going to be which court is going to hear this case? <clears throat> So selecting the proper court involves three separate and distinct issues. First thing they're going to determine is, is there subject matter jurisdiction? Do I have, sub I'm the court now, do I have subject matter jurisdiction over this case where this person ran over grandma? Number two, do I have personal jurisdiction over the parties in this case? And number three, is this the proper venue? So looking at that, let's look at subject matter jurisdiction first. What's the subject of this case? The subject of this case is a tort. It is a personal injury. I negligently backed over grandma, okay, and she was hurt. I had a duty not to back over her. I breached that duty and I caused her significant damage. Um, that's what subject matter juris, that's the subject matter of the case and subject matter jurisdiction, um, is where the court has to have the power or authority to hear this type of case. And in West Virginia, circuit courts and magistrate courts, depending on the value of this case, are going to have the authority to hear this. You also may find yourself in federal court, um, with federal jurisdiction. Um, and federal subject matter jurisdiction is where you have cases in which the United States, its agencies, or its officers, or parties. So, for example, if you have the United States versus Smith, um, that, might, that would be a criminal case. Um, and that would be the United States is a party, and they are prosecuting someone. Cases involving federal questions. Well, federal questions are things like constitutional issues. Is it constitutional to do X, Y, and Z? And thirdly, cases involving diversity of citizenship. That means citizens of different states, and the matter in controversy exceeds 75,000. Well, let's say I'm a resident of West Virginia. I ran over grandma, she is a resident of Pennsylvania, and the damages far exceed $75,000. This potentially could have uh, federal jurisdiction based on that third uh, one there. Now, there's things called supplemental jurisdiction. This is where the court will allow additional claims and additional parties to be added to an existing federal case without an independent satisfaction of the requirements of those three things we just talked about. In other words, these supplemental people or these supplemental cases wouldn't be able to find their way into federal court on their own. They have to kind of piggyback onto an existing federal case. The court sometimes will allow that if it's going to make the case that's already a federal case, if it's going to make it more efficient, there's going to provide more information, and overall justice will be better served if these cases are heard together and these people are all in the same case. Remo removal jurisdiction this is any case filed in a state court can be removed by the defendant, not by the plaintiff. It can be removed by the defendant to federal court if the federal court could have exercised original jurisdiction over the case when it was filed initially. You see, the plaintiff is the one that generally chooses the court in which they file their lawsuit, right? I mean, the plaintiff is the one complaining. They're the ones who take the papers down to the courthouse and file. So they choose. So the defendant has to have an opportunity to say, hey, you could have brought this in federal court. Why didn't you? So I want to remove this case to federal court where I think it belongs as the defendant. That's why plaintiffs cannot remove cases. They already had their chance to pick. So we talked about subject matter jurisdiction. So what is the case about? I ran over grandma. Personal jurisdiction is, okay, what about grandma and Leanne? How, what, what kind of jurisdiction do I have over them? That's, you know, personal jurisdiction looks at the specific litigants and says, do we have, do I have jurisdiction over these people? It's also called in personam 
jurisdiction. Now, sometimes the court is like, I don't know if I have jurisdiction over this individual. Um, they try to get jurisdiction over as many people as they can so that they can hear these cases that affect people that do uh, live within their state and within their boundaries. So there's states have come up with these things called long arm statutes, and you can imagine a really, really long arm reaching across the country to pluck somebody out of California or Illinois or New York or somewhere and bring them back to West Virginia. That's where they pull defendants back to the forum state to defend themselves when they engage in contact, which causes injury in the forum state. So if somebody's on vacation in West Virginia from California and they run over Grandma, and Grandma wants to sue, well, those people came into our state and they ran over Grandma, so a long-arm statute might say, it might, it, it might cause the court to say, I've got personal jurisdiction over you because you came in here and you ran over Grandma. Now, jurisdiction over a defendant cannot be exercised unless the defendant has at least a minimum contacts with the state in which the forum court sits. You can't just drag somebody in here who's never been here or doesn't have any contact with the state at all. That would not be fair. Um, now, personal jurisdiction over an individual may be exercised when the in individual is domiciled within the forum state. That means they live here, domiciled, is present within the forum state. Okay, you don't live here, but you are here in the state. Consents to a lawsuit within the forum state. Look, I don't live there and I'm not there, but I I'll go ahead. You can sue me there. Or they commit a tortious act which causes injury within the forum state. That's that California tourist running over grandma or does business with the forum state. This is like, you know, big car manufacturers. A lot of them are based out of Detroit, Michigan. I mean, they're not here in West Virginia, but um, they do do business because they sell their cars here in West Virginia, so we can sue them in our state. That's personal jurisdiction. That's minimum contacts and long-arm statutes. Now, the third thing when we're talking about jurisdiction is venue. Venue just refers to the geographic location um, where the case should be tried. It really doesn't become an issue um, until personal jurisdiction has been established. Um, and state court actions, venue lies where the cause of action arose, where the defendant resides, remember that, where the defendant lives, or where the defendant has either a place of business or an agent. So venue is really important to make sure that the defendant is within um, the, the, the area. Um, and if they're not, I mean, remember, they were established maybe perhaps with minimum contacts or a long-arm statute. Um, so they're going to try to get them somewhere where they have personal jurisdiction over them. Now, there's something called forum nonconvenience. And a federal court may decline to he hear a case where more than one federal court could meet the jurisdictional and venue requirements if the trial in the forum court would pose substantial inconvenience to the defendant and to the witnesses. Look, you can't just have a court case where nobody can attend. So that's sort of the idea behind that. If there's another court that can have jurisdiction and venue of the, over this, a federal court may say, let's move it to that other, that other court. It's just going to be more convenient for everybody involved. All right, let's talk, talk about the parties. We talked about jurisdiction. Now let's talk about the parties. Now, in my scenario, I ran over Grandma. Grandma's still alive. So it's me versus Grandma. Grandma versus me. Basic requirements for a party. If you're going to file a lawsuit, you have to be a real party in interest. A real party in interest is either one who is damaged or one who caused damage in a specific transaction or occurrence. Again, me and grandma. Now, can grandma's neighbor file a lawsuit against me for hurting grandma? No, not really. That person's not a real party in interest, are they? They're too far away from it. Grandma is the best person to sue on behalf of grandma. Now, if I killed grandma, then grandma's heirs, her relatives, okay, her children, her spouse, now those people have a wrongful death action against me, um, but not the neighbor, okay? And then Rule 17b requires that a federal party, now these are the rules of um, civil procedure, requires that a party have the capacity to sue or be sued. So, um, you can't really be a minor and sue on your own. You have to have a guardian ad litem. You can't be mentally incompetent. You're going to have to have a guardian. Um, you have to have the capacity to sue. Now, 
Sometimes there's more than one person that needs to be involved in a lawsuit. And sometimes they can join permissively, which means, yeah, it's okay if you join this lawsuit party that we're having. Come on board. Um, it's not a big deal. It'd be great if you, if you decide to sue. But you don't have to. You can. You can come on board. You can sue, but you don't have to. But then there's something called compulsory joinder, which means you have to. The court is like, look, we cannot move forward without you. You are an indispensable party. You are so essential to the litigation that moving forward without you would just be unjust. And a necessary party is one who's not indispensable, but who has an interest in the controversy and who should be joined for the sake of justice. So this person isn't indispensable, but boy, they should really... Uh, jump in there. And permissive joinder, like I said, this is like, look, it's not an absolute necessity, but nobody's going to get upset if you do jump in and join. Also, there's sometimes there's special parties that get involved. Um, intervention is Rule 24. That allows a person who is not an original party to the suit to enter of their own volition, of their own initiative. Okay, that's uh, under those permissive statutes. Um, I'm going to skip to impleader real quick. Impleader's the third one down. It says the defendant may implead a third person who he claims is liable to the defendant for all or part of the defendant's claim. Okay. Um, so basically what they're saying is the plaintiff sued uh, somebody. I ran over grandma. But what if I say, no, 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 I wasn't driving. My husband was driving. Please sue him. I can actually implead somebody who I think is actually more responsible than I am. Or what if, look, I tried not to hit grandma, but when I stepped on the brakes, the brakes didn't work. So I want you to sue Toyota or I want you to sue my car mechanic because it really wasn't me. It's I'm not at fault. So I can implead um, that person or that business. Um, class action is where there's a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of plaintiffs that you, you see these commercials all the time on TV. They're saying, hey, mesothelioma, if you or a loved one has contracted mesothelioma, please contact our law firm. It's because they're trying to bring people onto these class action lawsuits to settle them um, because so many people have the same claim. Consolidation. If, if lawsuits involve the same parties and contain common issues, a court is going to consolidate those multiple suits um, for trial and for judgment. I saved interpleader for last because it's kind of weird and it's a little bit different. All these other ones were about bringing other parties in. Um, interpleader is actually a mechanism through which a party protects themselves um, from having to play, pay the same claim twice in situations where he's uncertain who the proper claimant is. This is almost always in a situation where you have death benefits through a life insurance policy. Okay, so grandma is dead. Okay. Um, Grandma lists in her life insurance policy that the beneficiary of her life insurance policy will be her spouse. Well, at the time she entered into the life insurance policy, she was married to Henry. But then 10 years later, she divorced Henry and she married Fred. So the insurance is wondering which one counts as her spouse. Is it the person that she was married to at the time she entered into her life insurance? Or is it the person who she was married to at the time of her death? Both those parties have a claim, both Henry and Fred. They may both go to court and try to get that life insurance money. Well, in the meantime, the life insurance company is like, look, I don't know who to pay. So I'm going to put this money in the bank and I'm going to let the court fight it out. <laughs> so I don't have to pay both y'all. Okay. Um, so that's pretty much what... Um, an interpleader is. All right, moving on to pleadings. Under the federal rules of civil procedure, there are only three pleadings that are allowed. Everything else is called something else. When you refer to a pleading, you're only referring to these things, a complaint, an answer, and a reply to a counterclaim. That's it. Nothing else should be called a pleading. Okay? Counterclaims, cross-claims, and third-party complaints are the procedural equivalents of a complaint. So if you have those, you can also call them pleadings, but remember, it's because they fall into that family of being a complaint. All right, so looking at the complaint, obviously, you guys all know you've been in the program for a long time. All civil actions are commenced by filing a complaint. You can challenge uh, a complaint. Um, these are done in the form of motions. 
Um, some common challenges are it lacks jurisdiction. They have improper venue. Remember, we just talked about all that stuff. Insufficiency of process is where it wasn't served. Failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. It's like you're just your complaint is basically full of nonsense. Um, an answer is where the uh, defendant responds to the allegations contained in the complaint. They either admit, they dem deny, or they admit in part, denying the rest. You all have drafted complaints and answers. And an affirmative defense is an assertion which, if proved at trial, will negate the plaintiff's claim. Blah, claim. So a cross-claim and a counterclaim, what's the difference? A counterclaim is where, okay, I ran over grandma. Okay, so um, grandma is suing me because I ran over her. Okay, a counterclaim, which is, is where I'm like, no, wait a minute, I'm going to sue you, grandma. You're going to sue me. I'm going to sue you for the damage your big head did to my car. Now, that's not really a good lawsuit to bring, but that would be an example of a counterclaim. Ridiculous one. But it's where the plaintiff um, sues the defendant and then the defendant responds with a, a claim of their own. Okay, that's a counterclaim. Compulsory counterclaims arise from the same transaction, and if those are not brought at the time of the lawsuit, then they are waived. You can never bring those up again. Permissive counterclaims are where, hey, the same people are involved, but it's a different transaction. You can bring it up if you want to, but it's not a requirement that it be raised, and you can bring it to court another time. So let's say, for example, okay, Grandma's suing me because I ran over her. Um, but grandma is my tenant. I'm her landlord. So I sue her with a permissive counterclaim for, uh, her unpaid rent. Okay. Same parties. We're going to be in court. It's two entirely different things, but I can go ahead and bring that up since it's both of us going to be in court at the same time. A cross claim, um, is where you, uh, where you're either filing plaintiff versus plaintiff or defendant versus defendant. It has to involve the same subject matter as the original complaint or the counterclaim. Um, so, you know, oftentimes, you know, if I uh, sue the, my hospital that I went to for medical malpractice, they may say it wasn't us, it was your doctor whom I'm also uh, sued. So the hospital may um, cross-claim against the doctor who is another defendant. Amendments and default judgments, you can amend any of the pleadings. Remember, there are only three pleadings, the complaint, the answer, and the reply to a um, counterclaim, um, and any of those cross-claims and counterclaims. But you can amend those um, at any time before the responsive pleading is served. So the response would be the answer. Default judgment, if no responsive pleading is uh, filed, you can file a default judgment against the party. Um, and judgment may be entered against uh, the defendant without even having a trial. All right, moving on to discovery. This is a pretrial process. This is where the parties exchange all of the information they have. Um, and that way there's no big surprises whenever you actually get to court. You know, all of those court sequences that you see on TV and in the movies and everything where it's like, surprise, evidence! In real life, that doesn't really happen. The discovery process is designed to prevent that because the idea to have justice being served is that all parties are well aware of all of the facts in the case. There should never be any surprises when you get to court. Uh, but, of course, there are sometimes. <laughs> Some discovery devices, how do you get this information from the other side? Well, in the form of interrogatories, which are just questions that you ask each other and they're written, you can request them to produce documents, things. Um, you can say, hey, um, I, I want you to present something to me for inspection. I can even go out to look at property or crime scene or something. Um, request for physical or mental examination. Sometimes a lot hinges on uh, whether or not one of the parties... Um, is injured or hurt. If it's a personal injury claim like grandma, um, she's suing me. I want my own doctor to look at her and tell me how, how badly injured she is because I'm sure her doctor is saying that she's injured for the rest of her life and they're going to try to get as much money out of me as humanly possible. Um, and request for admission. This is where you make statements and the other party either has to admit or deny those statements, but you try to carefully craft the statements um, so that they're admitting to things that they really don't want to.
A deposition is where you interview the witnesses and the parties um, of both sides, um, and it's done under oath. Um, it's not done in court, but it is done under oath in front of a court reporter. Um, not everything is discoverable. There are some limitations. Some things are protected by the attorney-client privilege, obviously. There are some things protected by physician, patient, and clergy parishioner. There's something called the work product immunity. Um, as lawyers prepare for trial, um, they don't have to turn over their work product. Um, they shouldn't have to reveal their notes um, and those types of things. Anywhere where the lawyer uh, is using their own subjective thought about something, like, you know, I think my client's an idiot, or I think my client's going to win, there's absolute immunity. Those things are not ever to be turned over. Qualified immunity is given to other documents that are used to prepare for trial. Um, it can be overcome only with a very strong showing that the opposing party is, has a substantial need for those materials and that their equivalent cannot be obtained by any other means. Um, these things generally, I mean, it, it, most people play as fair as possible, and there's just some things that you just don't ask for. Compelling discovery. If a person makes a timely objection, fails to comply, or refuses to answer a discovery request, the burden falls upon the other party to seek a court order. You can actually say to the court, look, I asked for this stuff. They won't give me this stuff. Please compel them to turn it over to me. Now, not every complaint results in a full trial. In fact, most things are settled before they ever make it to trial. And how does this case get dismissed? Well, uh, or how does it end? Well, first of all, you can have a dismissal with prejudice, which means it cannot be refiled. This is where the court is really angry that this lawsuit even existed, so they will dismiss it with prejudice. A dismissal without prejudice means it can be refiled, that there was just some technical error um, somewhere along the way. That's generally why something would be dismissed without prejudice. Um, a voluntary dismissal. This is where the parties are like, yeah, let's just dismiss this case. And an involuntary dismissal is uh, an order by the court. For example, a summary judgment where the court says, look, there's really no dispute here, so I'm going to find in favor of such and such, either the plaintiff or the defendant. Um, based on these facts, there's no need to bring this to a full trial. Well, that's all I have for today. That is part one of the Civil Litigation Slide uh, Show series. I hope you have a good day. And as always, if you ever need anything, please don't do not hesitate to contact me.